So chapter 12 is antimicrobial therapy, and this is almost like pharmacology. Did you guys do pharmacology before? Okay, so it's kind of pharmacology, um, but I'm going to focus more on the um, uh, microbiology side of it. But there is part of pharmacology anyway that we have to do. Um, but again, I'm going to focus more on the part that's related to us. Um, so, as an introduction, the antimicrobial drugs, they come from many sources. We are, since we're doing the microbiology, we are talking about mainly uh, antibiotics. Antibiotics, antifungals, antivirus, and so on. This is what we're going to uh, be focusing on specifically, or more importantly, the antibiotics. Um, the antibiotics are coming from different sources, come, can come from different sources. Uh, the antibiotics specifically come from bacteria and fungus itself. It can come from bacteria and fungus. And the way they found out that they can use this for humans is they, um, uh, they, they um, uh, noticed or they watched the behavior of the bacteria. Like if I have a dish like this, and I have multiple bacteria, okay? I will, they notice that some bacteria are growing more than others. So they say, okay, why this is happening? They found out that these, this is the history. They found out that these bacteria that's overtaking uh, and, and controlling the medium is secreting something to kill the other bacteria so they do not compete with this bacteria, okay? Like bacteria A, type of bacteria, is growing more than B and C. Why? So they found that A, that's growing more, is secreting something. Uh, this something is inhibiting the other ones. So there will not be that much competition uh, to bacteria A. And they studied that and until they found out that this is actually the antibiotics. It's a chemical secreted to inhibit the other types of bacteria surrounding it. So, so they said, okay, why don't we take it and the bacteria that was inhibited, we can, we, we, we can kill this bacteria by this antibiotic. So they started to study that, and this, this is true for bacteria and for fungus and others. This is the, the very, very beginning, how they did the antibiotics. Uh, later on, they studied the composition of this chemical, which is the antibiotics, and they started to synthesize it in the lab. They started to make it. Of course, what we see, um, uh, the, the medications that we see in different pharmacies, it's not all coming from fungus and, and, and bacteria. We wouldn't have enough, right? So this is called synth um, uh, synthesized. It, it, it is um, uh, completely um, synthesized in the lab. There is a third category that is kind of combination between those which is they take the antibiotics that's coming from bacteria or fungus and they modify it in the lab. So this will give us the three categories. The natural one, you just took it from bacteria. Is that clear? Just coming from the bacteria or fungus, we'll take it as it is, isolate. The other one is we make it in the lab. The third one is how about we take the natural one and modify it a little bit in order to give us what we need. Selective toxicity. Anti means against. Biotic, bio means life, right? See, antibiotics means against life. A a and so, so when they discovered the antibiotics, they found that it's against the life of, of other bacteria, right? It's killing the other bacteria. So that's, that's where the name came from. Why did we call it antibiotics? It's against life. Against life of what? of the other bacteria, right? Which is good, that's not bad. But it should not be against the life of our cells. And this is what we call it selective toxicity. So it's against the life of bacteria, against life of what we don't want to be, to be there. But it's not harming our cells. Is that clear so far? How does these antimicrobials you can call it antimicrobial 
uh, germicidal, whatever you call it, how do these stop infection? They are going to stop the bacteria somehow, right? Like the, they notice that this type A bacteria is stopping the other types. How? How does it happen? It can work on different levels. And we will have, we have details to discuss about this. Just take a look at this for now. And you will notice that if this is a bacteria like this, you have cell membrane. And what's unique about bacteria being a prokaryote is the cell wall. Do you remember this? Yeah. Outside of the cell membrane, unlike ourselves, we do not have a cell wall. Eukaryotes, most of them do not have a cell wall. Bacteria does, being prokaryote. And being prokaryote, what we don't have? The nucleus. But do we have genetic material? Yeah. Yes, but not inside a nuclear membrane, right? So they also have some ribosomes, but they don't have the rest of uh, the eukaryote structures. So the antibiotics will work on one of those, what you see here in the picture. Can work on the wall, can work on the membrane, can work on the ribosome, it can work on the genetic material, whether it is DNA or RNA, and we will discuss that, but this is basically, as an introduction, this is generally speaking how they work. Um, if this antibiotic is selectively toxic to the, mi to the microbes, to the bacteria, we call this selective toxici toxicity, right? So if this type of antibiotics is toxic and it's against the life of, of other bacteria, not ours, this is good, right? But even though it does not kill our cells, but is it doing some harmful effects? It's not killing it, but do, can we have other things besides, it's not killing, but can we have something else? Yes, we can have other side effects. We can have something like uh, allergy. It's not killing, right? So it is selectively toxic, but it's, it can cause allergy, for example. Uh, it can cause other reactions. Uh, one thing that's, that's important to know is do we know that we have a good bacteria in our gut, in our intestine? Yeah. We do have good bacteria, right? And we call it the normal flora. Mm -hmm. This is something that you have to have. It's not only that's not harmful, it's actually beneficial. The best example of that is vitamin K. The vast majority of vitamin K come from bacteria in our large intestine, right? Yeah. Besides, it is the most important part why the, the normal flora is important for us. We have number of bacteria in our uh, large intestine, let's say, or in our gut in general, right? These bacteria have a balance between them. So if a harmful bacteria came, it will only compete. It will compete with them, right? With the bacteria that we have. So it will not be easy for the harmful bacteria to take over because there is a competition. But the problem is, if we are using this type of antibiotics that kills our normal flora, and now you're having this type of bacteria that does not have competition, is it going to be stronger and more harmful? Does it make sense? So under normal circumstances, if your normal flora is working just fine, you have different types of good bacteria, if, uh, if a bad bacteria come, it will compete. So you're kind of resisting, right? You com you're competing with your, bac your bacteria is competing for you, right? Of course, the bacteria is doing that for itself, but it's protecting us at the same time. So be having a competition is a good thing. But if you take antibiotics specifically, the broad spectrum, and we will talk about the details, but if you're taking an a broad spectrum antibiotics, it will not only kill the bad bacteria, it will kill your good bacteria, your normal flora. So if a bad bacteria come, there will not be that competition and they will take over and it will be a lot more uh, harmful. The other issue with uh, the, the different medications is the drug resistance. We hear about that all the time. To the extent of they stopped some antibiotics, they said we're not going to use this antibiotic anymore. Why? Because of the drug resistance. 
Some bacteria are resistant to drug. And they stopped gi giving these types of antibiotics to this type of bacteria. In, in medical school or nursing or whatever you're doing, they will tell you that you cannot use this uh, antibiotic for this bacteria. Uh, but we used to use it, like 30 years ago. We used to use it, yes, not anymore. Why? Because the bacteria now is resistant. How the bacteria become resistant? It was okay before and now it's resistant. It was okay, it was sensitive. What happened? Uh, a lot of things can happen that the bacteria become resistant. They can change their genes. N not intentionally, it just happened. Spontaneous. Like something happened to the gene, they change, and the medication is not effective anymore. Some bacteria, they found out that some bacteria will release enzymes to break down the antibiotics. Okay? And here is exactly the history. So just understand this. Here is what's happening. I'm giving antibiotics that's killing the bacteria and everything is fine, okay? That's in the history, everything is okay. Giving bacteria, patients are being treated and everything was going fine, okay? Until some of these bacteria, they have genetic, spontaneous genetic mu mutation or something, or others that are secreting chemicals, and those only few, they started to resist, okay? But you're still calling the vast majority, so the vast majority are killed and those are staying. And those who stayed and have this good ability for them, against us, right? If they secrete that chemical, this is bad for us, but good for them, right? So those who stayed are going to exist. Not only exist, they're going to replicate and reproduce. So what actually happened is you're getting rid of the sensitive bacteria that you're wiping them off, and the other ones you can't, you cannot do anything, so they, they flourish, and this is the one that we see now. For this type of antibiotics, so they change the antibiotics later. There are different ways that we will we'll see which is which. Uh, if you are going to choose drug or antibiotic in this case, uh, what should you put in, your, um, in mind uh, and this would be useful later on if you're like doing nursing or you're going to, to be um, uh, uh, studying pharmacology and you need to understand how to choose. What's the most important thing? The nature of the infectious agent, like what, what type of bacteria is that? So I can choose a good antibiotic for it. This is one. I need to know if this bacteria is uh, sensitive to the drug that I'm going to, to do or not. What kind of side effects? is it going to do? And what kind of a patient? Is the patient healthy, young, or old, or it, does he have a disease that can be, or a condition that will be affected? So this will all, all of this, we have to put it into consideration when we choose uh, the appropriate antibiotic. So generally speaking, the antimicrobial chemotherapy it's supposed to, as we mentioned before, it's supposed to, to be antibiotic to the bacteria, but not antibiotic to us. Against the life of the bacteria, not against our life or, the, or, or our cell's life. What do you call this? If, if it is, it can kill the bacteria, it's against the life of the bacteria, not ours. Selective toxicity selective toxicity. So what's selective toxicity? It's selectively toxic. What do you mean by selectively toxic? It is toxic against bacteria, not toxic against us. Is that okay so far? Yeah. Okay, these antibiotics that I mentioned before, it can be natural, it can be synthetic, it can be synthetic. Uh, there is no perfect drug. Like if you say, okay, I'm going to choose the perfect one. Uh, this one is, is not harmful to, the, to our cells, it's harmful to the bacteria, it does not have side effects, does not have anything. No, that's not true. There will be something, but you're choosing the best of what you have, okay? This is how we choose our medication. It is, there is nothing perfect. So the ideal antimicrobial, ideal me doesn't mean perfect. 
Is that clear? There is no perfect. Ideal means the best of what you have. It should be selectively toxic, obviously toxic to the microbes, not to ourselves. It's better to be microcidal rather than microstatic. Like if, if I have a choice of two antibiotics, both of them are effective. One of them will kill the bacteria and the other one will, what static means? Yes, to stop the growth or, or to slow it down, right? Which one would you choose? The, if both of them are good, if both of them are okay, both of them are effective, which one would you choose? The, the sidal or the static? The sidal, it will kill your bacteria rather than slowing them down, right? If you have the choice, like if both of them are good, which one should I choose? The one that kills the bacteria, obviously. The other thing is it, sh it should remain potent for long enough time until you get rid of the bacteria, meaning if you're using this antibiotic or using this drug, you need to know uh, the lifetime of, of this um, uh, medication. How long does it stay? Like I take it uh, and it go to my blood. Is it going to stay like for a couple of hours or is it going to stay for a couple of days? Okay. And how many times should I take it if that's the case? Like, do you know that there are some medications you take it once a, once a day? and others you take it three times a day, four times a day, right? Depending on what? Depending on the, the potency, how potent it is, how long does it stay? If it stay for a, for, for a day, I can take it once a day, right? So this is th this something that we should put into consideration that it should stay enough. You can't use something that stay less than what it should and it will not be effective enough. Um, you, need, you need to also choose an, an the antibiotic or the antimicrobial to that microbe that's not resistant. And I talked about this before. If I know that this uh, exam, the best example that they always use is the staph. Do you, do you remember the staphylococcus? Yeah. Staphylococcus, there are some strains of those, some uh, type of those are resistant to some type of, of penicillin called mesicillin. Should I use mesicillin? Of course not. You know that this is staphylococcus, most likely it's not going to work, right? So this is one factor to choose. Uh, you also try to choose a medication that help or complement the activities of the host defense. Something you're using that will work with your natural defenses, right? So oh, this is important to know, and you are going to put all of these factors, five factors, you need to put these into consideration when you decide which antibiotic should I use. Or when the, the pharmaceutical companies try to like uh, come with a medication or something, they need to put this into consideration. Is that clear? This is how they choose. Otherwise, it will not be approved. So it should remain active. This is another thing, should remain active and not become very diluted. Like if it is going to be diluted to a certain extent, is it still effective or it's going to be really diluted? So I can't use it. If that's the case, we will not use it. We will not, the pharmaceutical companies will not take a license to produce it, right? They will tell them uh, this medication that you're giving us and you're trying to get approval, it, 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 it dilutes very fast. So no, that's not, that's not good enough. It's not going to be effective. The other thing is, um, can it be delivered to the site of infection? Like uh, if I have infection, you're giving me, for example, you're, give, you're giving me an ointment and you're telling me I'm taking this medication for pneumonia, for example, no. You, ha you have to have this medication that go to the side of the infection. Like you're telling me, this injection will go to uh, infection in the intestine, for example. I would say, yes, okay, that's fine. Or you're taking this antibiotic with um, uh, ingestion, you're ingesting the antibiotics, and it's working on the intestine. Or it's going to the blood, and this is how it will go. So it has to be, have a way to be delivered, or it has to have a way to go to the site of the infection itself. The other thing is it also should be 
uh, reasonably priced. You don't tell me that this medication is an alternative medication that uh, uh, the, 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 the capsule is uh, $100, for example. No, we're not going to choose that, right? If, if you are a nurse or a doctor, you're not going to choose that. Unless, unless, if this is the only option, right? Which most likely it's not the case for antibiotics. We try, we try to use the, the one that's reasonably priced. The other thing is, uh, we need to choose something that does not disrupt the host health. Like it does not cause allergy. Uh, if, um, um, you know that um, any, any, any patient, when, when he go to the doctor, to the nurse, they ask them, do you have any allergies? What's the one that's very famous to have allergy in the antibiotics? Huh? Penicillin. Penicillin, right? They always specifically ask you, uh, do you have allergy against penicillin? So if that's the case, of course, I don't give you penicillin, right? I give you something else, and so on. Uh, antibiotics, as I mentioned before, it's a metabolic product of aerobic bacteria and fungus. They produce it, and I told you how they found out, right? They put the bacteria on the dish and see that this bacteria secreting something to kill the others. What is that something? It, it, they found out that this is something, a, a chemical compound, and we will call it antibiotics, okay? So it is a natural metabolic product of these bacter bacteria and fungi, all right? Here is an example, bacteria, Streptomyces, uh, you need to know the names by the way. Uh, this is almost pharmacology, so you, you will have to know the names. Streptomyces, what's the streptomyces? This is a bacteria, they found this type of bacteria secrete a chemical compound, okay, that kill other bacteria around it. So the antibiotic, they called it an antibiotic, and they call that antibiotic streptomycin. So what's a streptomycin? It's the antibiotic that's secreting from, secreted from streptomyces, from that bacteria. Uh, bacillus. They found that the bacteria bacillus, do you remember bacillus? Looks like rod shaped. They found this bacillus to secrete a chemical compound. So they call it an antibiotic. And what should we call that antibiotic? Bacitracine, Bacitracine, Bacillus, but it's coming from the name. The antibiotic that's coming from the bacteria or fungus, it comes it come from the name of the bacteria or fungus. Is that clear enough? The bacteria is called streptomyces. What should I call the antibiotic? Streptomyosin. If the bacteria is called Bacillus, what should I call the, an the antibiotic? Bacitracine, Bacitracine. Bas it's coming from bacillus, right? Bacitracy. Others, penicillium. Penicillium is, is, a, is, come, uh, is a mold, uh, w which is obviously a fungus, right? A mold is a form of fungus. Do you remember this? So penicillium is coming from this mold. What should we call the antibiotic? I would call it penicillin. Okay? Penicillin. Uh, the other type of mold is called cephalosporium. What should I call the antibiotic that come from those molds? Cephalosporin. Okay? You will notice that the vast majority of these antibiotics will end with IN. Streptomyosin, bacetracin, penicillin, IN, cephalosporin, IN. Okay, it's, it's not that simple, but it will usually end by IN. Okay? So I want you to remember these examples with the antibiotics that come from them. Okay? You need to remember this. Bacteria like streptomyces and bacillus. What's the antibiotic? Mm -hmm. You will see the names. I'm, I'm, I'm not telling you to, to remember it right now, but you will see it. But you have to remember it at the end. Streptomyces and bacillus are bacteria. Antibiotic is streptomycin and bacitracin. Penicillium and cephalosporium. These are molds. These are fungi. What are we going to call the antibiotics that come from those? 
penicillin and cephalosporin. Okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, can you answer this question for me? From the characteristics of the drugs, which one is not important? E? Yeah. Yes. Static is not better than sidon. Sidon, of course, is better. So here are some examples. But um, I told you the most important already, okay? Penicillium, cephalosporium, bacillus, streptomyces, okay? Streptomyces, streptomycin is uh, the most important one. Just remember this is good enough to know, okay? Streptomyces, like the previous uh, slide, but here's getting you the name. So what you call, this is a streptomyces. What is this? Is this a bacteria or mold? Mm -hmm. This is bacteria. What's the name of the antibiotic come from this? Cetomycin. Bacillus bacetrazine. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm, I'm just showing you this to see the names here that I was just mentioning. Okay? The other two are molds, these, right? Mm -hmm. Penicillium is a mold, cephalosporium is a mold. It's a fungus, right? What's the name of the antibiotic that comes from the mold, the fungus penicillium? Penicillin. Cephalosporium, cephalosporin. Okay? So you see the names here. Uh, what I mentioned is, is the most important, okay? Which is the previous um, slides. Mm -hmm. uh, as usual, you will notice that I will focus on certain things more than others. Do the same thing. Focus on what I'm focusing on, okay? I'm giving you the, like, the most important of all. Uh, this slide is extremely important. Very important. So now, every single one of those, what does it mean? Okay? So go one by one, but you have to remember it anyway. Very important. Uh, what chemotherapeutic drug, generally speaking? Chemo means chemical, right? Therapeutic means treatment, isn't it? Yeah. Therapy. So chemotherapeutic drug is a drug that the, the, the chemical that's used to treatment to treat or not necessarily treat it can be used as prophylaxis what's the difference between treatment and prophylaxis yes treatment is you are sick already you have the infection i give you treatment prophylaxis is you're not sick but i give it to you so you don't become sick you don't get sick. So this is prophylaxis is, is a prevention. If you are at risk, like you're a nurse, you are dealing with patients, you're a doctor, you're dealing with patients, and I know that you're working on this uh, unit and you might get this infection, I will give you the antibiotics. I'm not going to wait for you to get the infection and give you a treatment. No, I'll give you a prophylaxis, okay? Antimicrobials, generally speaking, this is a general term like an umbrella that's, where you, that's used to, 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 to call any drugs in general, whatever the origin is, antimicrobials. And then, depending on the origin, we will have categories. But what do you call any one of those? You call it antimicrobial. Any drug that kills the microbes, what should I call it? Antimicrobial. Okay? Irrespective of where it came from, I just call it um, anti-microbial. Uh, uh, now, depending on where it comes from, I will have three different options. If it is a natural metabolic product of microbes, uh, whether we're talking about bacteria or uh, fungus, like we, we mentioned it, right? Penicillin, cephalosporin, bacitracin, streptomycin, we mentioned those, right? This is coming from organisms, isn't it? Coming from microorganisms. So I call that antibiotics. If you completely make it in the laboratory or the pharmaceutical companies, in the factories, I will call that synthetic, like from scratch. I didn't get anything natural. I know the components, I will make one like this, okay? We call that synthetic. The third one is, you get the natural one, and you do some modification 
just modification to make it better. I call that semi-synthetic. Is that clear? You get the difference between antibiotic, synthetic, and semi-synthetic. Okay. Um, generally speaking, when we talk about antibiotics, it can have a limited spectrum, like they work against gram-positive bacteria only. Do you remember gram-positive and gram-negative? We talked about those. Do you remember? Gram-positive bacteria, if I have this antibiotic that work on gram-positive uh, gram only, I call it narrow spectrum. If it is working against both of them, gram-positive and gram-negative. Do you remember what was the difference between the gram-positive and gram-negative? Uh, uh, one of them take the state and the other one doesn't take it, but what's the difference in the bacteria itself? Why it didn't take it? Why it's negative? You have something additional. But all of them have a wall. Now they have additional membrane outside of the wall. Like membrane, wall, membrane again. Well, we did this before, maybe forgot or something, but this is what it is. Why the, the positive will take it? Because it go to the wall. How about the negative? No, they have additional membrane outside of the wall, so it will not take it, right? If it have addition, it would be negative, yes. So what if you have an antibiotic that can work on both of them, positive and negative? I call it broad spectrum. Is that clear? Yes. So narrow spectrum work against gram positive only. Broad spectrum work against positive and negative plus, here is one important, plus our natural, including, not plus, including our normal flora. So which one kill our normal flora? Narrow spectrum or broad spectrum? Broad spectrum, is that clear? Narrow spectrum kills RAM positive only. Broad spectrum kills positive, negative, and our natural flora. Is that clear? Okay. So if you're taking narrow uh, spectrum, that will usually, it will not kill your natural flora. Again, interaction between the drug and microbes. The drug should kill the microbe. It should be toxic to the microbe, not to us. And we call that selective toxicity. Okay? Uh, the problem would be, remember that we're not only talking about, we're saying antimicrobial. We're not only talking about bacteria, right? We're talking about everything. Bacteria, fungus, mantis, protozoa, viruses, right? We need medications or antimicrobial against each one of those, right? Here is the issue. When it comes to bacteria, the bacteria are prokaryotes, isn't it? So it's different than our cells. So it's easy to use an antimicrobial agent against bacteria because it's not even eukaryotes. But the problem is, if you're working against fungus, Protozoa, Helminthus, isn't that eukaryotes? Do you remember that? It's all of this are eukaryotes, right? Prokaryotes are bacteria and archaea, right? Anything else is eukaryotes. So what's the problem with the eukaryotes? They have a lot of com com common characteristics of our own cells. So it will be kind of hard to, make, to, to use uh, antimicrobial against them. We do have some antimicrobials, but just remember that we have an issue here, right? That there are a lot of similarities between the other types. So it's easy to use antibiotics for, for, for bacteria. It's not easy to use antimicrobial for other things, including fungus, helminthus, uh, protozoa, anything else that's eukaryotes. And did you get the idea? Prokaryotes, you can target something in the, in the bacteria specifically. But our cells doesn't have it. Isn't that easy? Kind of easy, right? Like you're targeting the cell, the cell wall, for example. Uh, do we have a cell wall? That do, do we as humans, do we have a cell wall? No, we don't have a cell wall. So, uh, so that's good, isn't it? You can target the cell wall and you're fine. But, but, any, you, any eukaryotes, other eukaryotes, they do not have a cell wall, right? So you need to target the cell membrane. It can target your own cell membrane. Isn't that hard? Mm -hmm. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. 
We will have different ways uh, of the medications to work. They can work on the cell wall, inhibiting the cell wall synthesis. They can work on the cell membrane, breaking down the structure or the function. Structure or function, we will see it. It can interfere with the function of DNA or RNA. Not just the function, it can actually interfere with anything related to those. Do you remember transcription and translation and, right? Uh, it can inhibit any of those. It can also inhibit protein synthesis somehow. It can block meta metabolic pathways somehow. We will see all of this, but you just need to have this idea first. What are you going to work? Uh, I'm going to work on any part of the bacteria, for example. Does the bacteria have a cell wall? Yes, we can work against the cell wall. Does it have a cell membrane? Yes, we can work against the cell membrane. Does it have genetic material? We can work against the genetic material, right? Uh, bacteria have ribosomes? Yes. Can we work against the ribosomes to stop protein synthesis so the bacteria die? Yes. Uh, can we block some pathways like reactions and we stop these reactions? We can. So these are the different mechanisms uh, that, will, uh, that we will work on to kill the bacteria. Here you will see a lot of names. But I will tell you something here to make it easy for you. Okay? This is a lot. We will need to know a lot of those, but not every, every, every one of those. I will tell you the most important. Okay? First of all, in this category, we're working on the protein synthesis. So which level of the, of the organism are you working on? Which organelle? If you wanted to stop protein synthesis, what part of the bacteria are you work to, going to work on? Ribosomes. Ribosomes, right? So he is giving you some details. I wouldn't really, I should, I just remember that it worked on the ribosomes, generally speaking, okay? And what are the examples of those? I would remember chloramphenicol, erythromycin. I put those in a separate slot. I added a slide specifically for those, just to point out to the most important ones. Erythromycin, chl uh, chloramphenicol, and these are called amino glycosides, which is streptomycin and tetracycline specifically important. And you need to remember that it's called amino gly glycosides. If you forgot it, amino means amino acid. Isn't that protein? So it should remind you. Okay. So this is what I want you to know. So how many of those? Well, I just mentioned. One, two, three, four. From this side, from the protein synthesis, I want you to remember four, okay? It's good enough to remember that it stops protein synthesis by working on ribosomes, good enough. Clear? Okay, yes. Yes, um, chloramphenicol erythromycin, this is two, chloramphenicol, here it is, chloramphenicol erythromycin, one, two. The other two are called amino glycosides, streptomycin, tetracycline, good enough. These are the most important ones. There are others, you can take a look at it if you want to. Uh, the other ones will work on the cell wall. And these include a lot of things, but the most important of all are penicillin, cephalosporin, uh, isoniazide. Isoniazide is also known as INH. Uh, you need to know this. Penicillin, cephalosporin, isoniazide. Uh, I'm sorry. Penicillin, cephalosporin, vancomycin, bacetracine, and isoniazide. So don't worry about those three. Penicillin, cephalosporin, vancomycin, bacetracine, and isoniazide. Put, put, beside isoniazide, put INH. You will see it, it's coming, okay? Uh, uh, working on the cell membrane, polymexin. You need to remember this. Uh, DNA, RNA, quinolones, and RFMB, okay? So, a lot of those, most of those, but not every single one of them. Uh, for this one, 
uh, sulfa is, is good enough. For the metabolic pathway, sulfa or sulfonamide is enough. You will see it in the, in the next chapter. It just here, it's, it put it on um, the bacteria itself, so it might be easier to remember. Okay, and you will see the slides. But again, spectrum. What now the spectrum means? Work against specific type or a specific group of bacteria. Gram positive, for example. Okay? Broad spectrum, we work on a uh, greater range. Uh, positive, negative, but they also kill what? Broad spectrum. What would they also kill? Your normal flora, yes, your own good bacteria, okay? Uh, if this working on the cell components like the cell wall, um, that will be more of broad spectrum, like this, broad spectrum. And the cell, for example, is medium, tetracycline is broad, broad. Um, but broad spectrum usually work on the cell wall, okay? Um, drug that target the cell wall. <coughs> Those who target the cell wall are generally speaking um, uh, broad spectrum. And it is selectively toxic. Okay? All right. Um, now the target. Here is what, what I, th this is an additional slide. It wasn't there. Okay? So I put this to point out to the most important ones, which is, it's, n it's not few, but not all of it, okay? These are the most important ones. Uh, the ones that work on the cell wall. Uh, wh what do you mean by cell wall? Which part of the cell wall? It usually work on peptide of glycan specifically. Is that clear? When I see, so you need to remember, by the way, let me say this. Each of those medications, you need to tell me which part of the bacteria does it work on and the mechanism of action. You have to remember this. Is that clear? I mentioned in the beginning, this is almost a pharmacology, right? Yeah. But I'm trying to summarize it as much as possible, okay? It's still pharmacology. You have to know it anyway. Okay, and if you don't know it now, you will know it in pharmacology. So <laughs> you will need to know it anyway. So if I tell you any one of those that you need to memorize, you have to remember it. Penicillin, encephalosporin, vancomycin, bacitracin, and I and H. Uh, which part of the bacteria does it work on? Cell wall. What's the mechanism? How does it work? Peptidoglycan. Is that clear? Not enough to remember cell wall. Which part of the cell wall? Peptidoglycan. What's a peptidoglycan? It's a, an important component of the cell wall the most important component of the cell wall. Is that okay so far? For, for the protein synthesis, just remember those four. In the other slide, it was more than that. It was like eight or nine. But uh, if you remember those, these are the most famous ones. Tetracycline, streptomycin, erythromycin, chloramphenicol. The inhibitor protein synthesis, and good enough. And, and, and can you tell them the mechanism? How does it stop the protein synthesis? Working on which part of the cell? The type black like for the cell wall. This is a protein synthesis. Oh, right. 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 Yeah. So these four antibiotics work on ribosomes. How or what do they do to kill the bacteria? Inhibit protein synthesis. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. Next, rafambin and ciprofloxacin. They inhibit DNA and RNA. So where do they work? Genetic material. They work on the genetic material, DNA or RNA. What do they, do they exactly inhibit? Anything related to those? Anything. Anything. Transcription, translation, uh, replication, whatever it is. Uh, the next one is polymexin, which inhibit the cell membrane selective, selective permeability. Do you remember the selective permeability? The cell membrane should allow certain things of the bacteria. Should allow certain things that are good for the bacteria, the bacteria needed, it's allowed to go in, right? Anything that's bad, it's not allowed to get in, which is good for the bacteria, right? This antibiotic is going to disrupt this. So anything can go in. 
and this will kill the bacteria. Uh, uh, sulfonamides, which is, uh, we usually call it sulfa, it's called sulfonamides. Uh, sulfonamide, the inhibit metabo metabolic pathway. Uh, which pathway? Folic acid synthesis. So, again, this is an extra slide. I put it there to summarize what you have to know. But you have to memorize it anyway. Uh, here is what's happening. This is a bacteria, right? And this is a membrane. This membrane is selectively permeable. What does it mean? It's open, allow good things to go to the bacteria. And this is good for the bacteria so far, right? Here come the medication. It will play in the structure of the membrane so it will not become selectively permeable anymore. It will allow anything to go in. It will, it will die. Okay? So it disrupts the selective permeability. Okay? For those that affect the cell wall, what are these again? Well, we will have some more details, but I'm not going to go to every single word. I will tell you exactly what we have to know, right? Uh, so those are working on the cell wall. I mentioned it. Penicillin, cephalosporin, persitrosin, and INH, okay? Um, they work on the cell wall. Uh, what part of the cell wall? What part of the cell wall? Peptide of lichen. Peptide of lichen. Yeah, you have to remember this. Okay? Uh, the, the first person who discovered penicillin, his name is Flank. How did he discover it? He discovered it by these types of bacteria, secrete something. The, he took that something and he called it, because the bacteria called penicillium, he called it penicillin. But the name uh, is good to remember Fleming. Who discovered the penicillin? Fleming. <coughs> Fleming. Okay? Uh, penicillins work more against gram positive. Okay? There are, um, uh, uh, let me say it this way without going on into all the details. <coughs> penicillins. There are different types of penicillins. Okay? Uh, this is not really pharmacology. I'm not going to go through the details more than that. But just generally speaking, there are different types of penicillins, okay? The older ones cannot cross uh, the outer cell membrane. So they will not work on the gram negative. This is the old category. The broad spectrum one, they can. So they can also affect both of them. So there are broad, broad spectrum penicillin and cephalosporins, okay? Do we have broad spectrum and not spectrum from the same antibiotic? Yes. There are different medications under the same name. Like I call this category penicillins. Penicillins. But this is not a medication, by the way. When you say penicillin, I don't mean one. Are we following? Yeah. Did you get what I mean? Yeah. So penicillin, this is a big category. And then different types, ampicillin, mesicillin, a lot of things that fall under the penicillin. Some of those are against positive and some of those are broad spectrum. Okay, look at this. This is what I was just describing. This is a gram positive. Look at this brown part. And look at this brown part. Do you see something on top of this? You see this green? This is an additional thing. Compare this to this. This is this. You have additional, this green. Yes, this is the outer membrane, and this is characterizing the gram negative. Did we get this? So the gram negative, again, have an additional cell membrane outside of the cell wall. When we say beta-lactam antimicrobials, just remember that we are talking about penicillin and cephalosporin. Good enough. Penicillin and cephalosporin are beta-lactam. What's the beta-lactam? Chemistry. This is the chemistry. Okay? Enough to know. 
When I say beta lactam, we're talking about those two, penicillin and cephalosporin. So I mentioned that penicillin is a big category. It's a group of products, it's not just one, okay? Some of these penicillins are natural. What natural means? You take it from the what? From the microbes themselves. When I say natural, which is the antibiotics, you take it from the microbes themselves, okay? It can be synthetic, meaning, do we make penicillin in a lab? Yes, we do. Uh, can we have a third category? Like, can I get that natural penicillin and modify it a little bit? Yes. What do you call this? Semi. Yes, semi synthetic. Okay. So we have three types of penicillin. Yes. It can be natural penicillin, antibiotic. It can be synthetic. It can be semi synthetic. And when you talk about this, just know that we have different types. This is kind of too much. Okay. Just remember what I'm just saying, okay? Penicillin can be natural, antibiotics, synthetic, semi-synthetic. And we have different types of antibiotics that fall under the name of penicillin, okay? Like when you say penicillin G and penicillin V, uh, v. Uh, wh where did you get this from? Uh, I get it from the, from the, from the microbes, okay? Uh, so this is for the natural, semi-synthetic like ampicillin and amoxicillin, and this is broad spectrum. And some of them are semi uh, uh, then, I mean this is semi-synthetic, and some of them are synthetic completely, okay? Uh, they notice something here. Okay, let me, let me emphasize this. I'm, if you notice, I'm not, I'm not going through everything. Here is what I, what I want you to know. Penicillin, what should I know? Number one, it's beta-lactam. Number two, together with the cephalosporin. Both of them are beta-lactam. Number two, both of them work on the cell wall. Okay? Number three, penicillin is a big category. We have different types. How are you going to divide the different types? Can be natural can be synthetic, can be semi-synthetic. Am I being clear so far? Okay. Um, the semi-synthetic one are usually the broad spectrum. Okay? Because simply you modify the natural one, which were more against positive, you modify it, so it works against negative as well. Is that clear? Okay. Here are the two issues with the penicillin that we need to understand. Number one, it's very famous that some people have penicillin allergy. And I think we all hear about it all the time. So this is number one issue, penicillin. And the problem is not in the penicillin itself. It's in the individual who have this allergy, right? Uh, do you guys remember the haptin or not? Haptin? Haptin is half antigen. The penicillin is haptin, meaning it's half antigen. So it, it can work on, if you have allergy against this penicillin, the penicillin will act as a half antigen. And it might lead to allergy. This is problem number one. Problem number two. Many organisms produce enzyme that break down penicillin. Why? We don't know. It just happened. They found it. Some of these bacteria secreted something and they found out that this something broke down the, the, the penicillin. They call this enzyme penicillinase. Do you remember ASE at the end of any word? It's an enzyme. So what's a penicillinase? An enzyme that breaks down penicillin. Penicillin ase, right? So if, if that's the case, penicillin, if the, if the uh, bacteria produce penicillinase, what should we do now? They, tr they started to play in the, in the laboratory with the different types of penicillin. They come up with those. You don't really have to remember the name, but just know that um, penicillin, penicillin is resistant ones. Yeah, like, just remember that there are some penicillins 
Just remember this, okay? Some penicillins cannot be broken down by penicillinase. We call it penicillinase resistant. How did they come with this? They changed it in the laboratory. They studied this. You know how? They got the penicillin and I put penicillinase on it. I see it bre breaking down the penicillin, right? And then I will study in the lab how exactly is it breaking it down. Uh, it will cut in this area. How about if we change so it doesn't cut it? Is that clear? That's it. So they developed some type of penicillin that is resistant to penicillinase. So if this, uh, if this organism is, is producing penicillinase, I will give you one of those. The one that you need to remember is mesicillin only. Just remember this. Mesicillin as a penicillinase resistant for a reason. I will tell you the reason later on. Okay? But just remember this example. Are we following? I know this is a lot, and it's not easy, but are we following so far? Okay. So this is the penicillinase resistance. Cephalosporin. Nothing much to remember about this. I only want you to know that this is also a beta lactam, but most of it is synthetically altered. They take it just like the penicillin and they change a little bit of it. Why did you do that? Why are you taking this cephalosporin uh, and changing it to avoid the allergy? Because it's very, isn't both cephalosporin and penicillin are beta lactam, right? So uh, penicillinase, the, the bacteria that secrete penicillinase, will break down the beta lactam. So what can we do now? Uh, I will do something to change the beta lactam that doesn't break down. And that's how they came up with this type of cephalosporin. That they changed the, the chemistry of the beta lactam. By the way, beta lactam is just a ring structure, if you, if you wanted to know. Okay? Good enough to know about the cephalosporin. What do I need to, uh, to know about the cephalosporin? It's a beta lactam. Synthetically altered to avoid allergy. It has less uh, allergic reactions and the issue of penicillinase as well. But it's more for allergic reactions. So here is, let's just let, let me say it from the medical point of view. If I want to give you penicillin, and this is my medication number one, okay, I will tell you, uh, sir, you have this type of infection, I would like to give you penicillin. This is my choice, okay? Uh, do you have allergy against penicillin? Yes, uh, okay. Now I have to give you cephalosporin. That's, that's, that will be my number two if you have allergy. Is that clear? So usually cephalosporins, the, the, the modified ones, we use it if you have allergic reactions. I'm not gonna give you something to, to develop allergy. Uh, next group. is carbapenium car or carbapeniums and uh, monopactam. Amipenium is a broad spectrum that works against aerobic and anaerobic. Uh, Astronam is a narrow spectrum that works against negative specifically. Okay. Um, penicillin and cephalosporin is more important, but if you wanted to remember Amipenem and Astronam, Amipenem work against aerobic and anaerobic. Now vancomycin. Vancomycin is a very narrow spectrum, but it's extremely effective against the Staphylococcus. Let me say this. Vancomycin have a lot of toxicity, so we don't use it until we have to, unless we have to. Vancomycin is another spectrum, but it has a lot of adverse effects. So if you are a doctor or a nurse or something, and you think you should use the vancomycin, you need to think twice. It's toxic, okay? Uh, so if it's toxic, why are you using it? Do you remember I just told you to remember mesicillin? This is for penicillinase resistant. 
they cut, they came up with with penicillin to avoid the issue of penicillin, right? Staphylococcus, some of these staphylococcus are resistant to the mesicillin itself. What should I do now? Then I have to use vancomycin. So, do you use vancomycin routinely? Of course not. Why? It's very toxic. When should I use it? If this, if, if, if this organism secretes penicillin, why don't you use the mesicillin? If it is mesicillin resistant, did you get the idea? And we call that MRSA. MRSA. What's MRSA? Mesicillinase resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Mesicillinase resistant Staphylococcus aureus. What do you mean? Here's what I mean. Pay attention. I have bacteria. I can use penicillin. This is my first choice. Penicillin is one of the safe antibiotics, okay? Use penicillin. Uh, but the, the my bacteria is secreting penicillin A's. What should I do now? Use mesicillin. What if this organism like Staphylococcus is resistant to mesicillin? Also, what should I do now? Vancomycin. Okay? Did you get the idea? So vancomycin should be reserved for MRSA only. Other than that, don't use it. MRSA. Mesicillin A's resistant Staphylococcus aureus. This is when, when you use it. And just for your information, if you think about it, wh what is this MRSA thing? What's, why some organisms, Staphylococcus, produce mesosyndinase resistance from the abuse of the antibiotics? You're using like penicillin like crazy. They give penicillin for everything. So when they do that, it's, um, it suppressed the normal flora, and this type came up, mesosyndinase resistance, changed its, uh, its structure and function, and it become resistant to mesicillin, and this one started to take the upper hand. Okay? Yeah. How long would somebody have to be using penicillin to develop MRSA? Uh, MRSA, it's, it, it developed already. No, it's, it's not like you take it and you develop MRSA. No, I'm saying how MRSA emerged in the first place, okay. in the history. So it, 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 it's not for one individual person, it's for a lot of people, everybody's using it, everybody's using it. So it, it came like, do you, do you remember the natural selection? Mm -hmm. You know what sele natural selection means? Right. So I have these type of bacteria, and I'm giving a penicillin randomly, okay? So not to, to one person, to a lot of people, right? So all of these people, all of these people are taking penicillin like crazy, right? So what happened is some of the organisms because you're taking the penicillin broad spectrum one, they suppressed their normal flora. And this type of bacteria, they started to change their structure and developed penicillin resistance. And then started to go from person to person to person. This is just the history. Not, I'm, I'm not saying if, if, you, if this is what you understood. I'm not saying how you develop MRSA. No. I'm saying how MRSA in the history. How did they develop? They developed by the abuse of, of antibiotics. This type emerged. It was naturally selected because it's resistant, stayed, and started to go from person to person to person. Okay? okay? But if the question is, how long does it take to inhibit your normal bacterial flora, not irrespective of the MRSA? How to suppress? It takes like two weeks or something to suppress them. And it has the dose has to be strong enough and broad spectrum. And this is the most important thing. Broad spectrum. Broad spectrum is the one that inhibits your normal flora. And so what, what should I do now? If I'm using uh, antibiotics and I'm using broad spectrum like for 10 days, two weeks, so now my normal flora is gone, right? What should I do now? You it will you can you can use vancomycin instead, but if you already took the antibiotics and you don't have the normal flora. What should I do now? Yes, when you stop using the antibiotics, it will go back. Yes, exactly. Okay? Uh, Bacitracine, where do you think it came from? Bacillus. Is bacillus it's a bacteria or fungus? Bacteria. And I told you you have to remember this. Bacillus is a bacteria, right? 
Streptomyces is bacteria. Yes, yes. Um, you are going to study and you're going to remember. I'm just trying to refresh your information. Okay? So remember that Bacillus is a bacteria, uh, Streptomyces is a bacteria, from which we have Bacitracin and Streptomyces. They come from bacteria. Uh, the fungus, Penicillin and Cephalosporin. Okay? They come from the mold. Penicillium and Cephalosporium. This is the fungus. Okay? So, Bacitracin is another spectrum. And usually, Bacitracin is used top, uh, topically. Top, uh, it, it's a topical agent. You get an ointment. Like if you if you go to the oh, it's even over the counter. You, if you go like you have an infection in your skin or something, they gave it to you. Uh, INH, INH uh, is used for. Do you remember I told you that every single medication you need to tell me where, which part of the bacteria does it work and how? INH, how does it work? Mycolic acid synthesis. And it, it worked for treatment of TB. I put INH here to, remember, to remind you, they don't have to say isoniazide. They can call it INH for short. Most of them mean the same thing. Okay? Uh, but it's used for TB, mycobacterium TB. INH is used for TB. Okay? How does it work? Interfere with mycolic acid synthesis. So, what, what, what does that mean? It works in the metabolic, metabolic pathway. Developing mycolic acid. Do you guys remember how they work? They work on the wall, they can work on the membrane, they can work on protein synthesis, they can work on DNA, RNA, and they can work on the metabolic pathways. Uh, which part is it? Mycolic acid. Uh, the ones that work on the membrane, how do they work? Uh, two different ways. You can either, here is what most of the time happens. Do you remember this? The cell membrane is two layers of phospholipid. Right? If you take out some of these lipids, you're going to break down the membrane. And the cell will die, simply. This is one way. The other way is to change the function instead of changing the, the structure. How to change the function? Selective permeability. You stop the selective permeability. This is how to work on the membrane. Uh, can you answer this question? I think it's easy. Vancomycin. Vancomycin. So polymexin is one. And I put that in the slide if you remember. The slide that I told you, the most important ones. Yeah, polymaxin is one that works on the membrane. And when you say membrane, I'm talking about the lipids, the phospholipids. Um, Amphotericin and mistatin. Uh, um, this, is, this will work also on uh, sterol, and sterol is a lipid, but it works on the fungus. Polymexin is against gram-negative bacteria. Amphotericin and statin work against the fungus. It's it's a, it's an antifungal medication. Nistatin specifically is the one if you if you like have a um, athletic foot or something and you go like over the counter. Can I get an ointment for this? Yes, they will give you the nistatin. Uh, the next type is the type that work on. Nucleic acid synthesis. What do you mean working on the nucleic acid synthesis? Meaning anything related to the nucleic acid. Do you remember the nucleic acid DNA, RNA? What, what exactly can you affect the nucleic acid synthesis? Any part. You can block the synthesis of the nucleotides in the first place. You can prevent replication. You can prevent transcription. Right? And the example of that is chloroquine. Chloroquine. Okay, good, good enough to know. Chloroquine. So how does the chloroquine work? Nucleic acid synthesis. 
Another one, chloroquinolones, they work against something called DNA gyrase and topoisomerase. Uh, this is something related to um, uh, related to the replication. Okay, this is a broad spectrum, and CDC recommended that you, you should, that we should monitor uh, the, the fluoroquinolones, specifically ciprofloxacin. Ciprofloxacin is one of the fluoroquinolones, and there is a lot of resistance now to that. So they say you have to be careful about using this. There is a lot of resistance coming. It's the same as they said for penicillin. You have to be careful with penicillin. When you say protein synthesis, which part of the bacteria are we talking about? Huh? Ribosomes. Ribosomes. You're working on ribosomes. And which ones should I, should I remember? I told you. The tracycline erythromycin. Streptomycin and uh, there is one more. Streptomycin, did I say? Yeah, streptomycin, okay. streptomycin, tetracycline, erythromycin. Remember that amino glycosides, okay? When you say amino glycosides, this is one uh, that works on the bacteria. Again, this is all in the same slide that I summarized this before. Next one is interfering with the metabolic pathway. Do you remember the sulfonamides I told you? Sulfonamides? Sulfonamides work on the metabolic pathway. Uh, which part of the pathway? Folic acid. You have to remember this. So um, here is what I, what I want you to do for the activity. You can do it now. You can do it later. That's fine. Again, when I tell you to do something, it's to help you study. It's not just for the points, okay? So what I want you to do is, you do the same thing, you, you do cards, you put the antibiotics on one side, only the ones that I told you, which is in the slide. Just go back to that slide, okay? In the front, you put the antibiotic. In the back, you put which part of the bacteria does it work on, and mechanism of action. Example here, sulfonamides. In the back, it works on metabolic pathways, specifically folic acid. That's it. Yes. So you want us to do it on that slide that had like the summary of the list? Yes. Okay. Take those antibiotics from that summary, and you put the name in the front, and you put two things in the back. Is that clear? Yes. Two things. You need to tell me which parts. This is one. Number two, mechanism. How exactly? Like you say, pathway. Okay, this is generally speaking. This is how that does it work. Like which, this is which part. Uh, but to be specific, it's folic acid. I'm not talking about all of this. Look, not all of this. Yeah. I just want you to tell me, sulfonamide. The, this is the, 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 the flash card, right? Sulfonamide. In the bag, metabolic pathway, folic acid. That's it. Okay? And you're going to use these slides to study from, okay? Um, so by doing this, it's something like, com this is competitive inhibition. Um, some sulfonamides, they compete. This is how they, they inhibit the bacteria, and, and this is not killing, by the way. What, what killing means? What's the suffix that mean killing? Sire. And what's the suffix that means slowing down or stopping? Static. static. So sulfonamides are usually static. Why? They, in this case, they work by they work by competing. Okay? They compete with the active side of the enzyme, so they stop the microorganism by competition. <coughs> Synergetic effect. Sometimes we use more than one antibiotic at the same time, which we call it combination therapy or multiple drug therapy, okay? They said, okay, how about sulfonamides 
And there's another one that work on a metabolic pathway that's called trimethoprim, for example. They said, how about we use both of them together? Why are you doing that? Because one of them is going to stop folic acid and the other one is going to compete, let's say, uh, on the uh, nutrition available. So if you use both of them, isn't that synergetic effect? Right? You work here and I work here. How about we use both of them together? And the most, the most common example of that is treatment of TB. Okay, when you do pharmacology, you will see that you cannot, you cannot treat TB with one medication at all. You cannot do that. It's very famous, it's very well known that, that uh, if you wanted to treat TB, it's a combination therapy. You give them about three different types of antibiotics. Three. Why? Because this is very resistant. So I will give you this medication that will stop your uh, folic acid, for example. I will give you this medication that will try to disrupt the cell membrane. And then I will give you this medication to stop the protein synthesis, right? So I'm working on three different levels at the same, so they work as synergy, synergetic. Did you, is, is that clear? The multi-drug or the combination therapy, it's used, it, it's work as synergetic. They have synergetic effect, working on different levels. So, in case if there is a drug resistance, uh, I'll give you an example of that. What if the TB have a cell wall that's resistant to this medication? And you give it the medication, it's going, is it going to be effective? <coughs> no. Do I know exactly what type of, of TB do you have? Of course I don't know, right? Uh, all what I know is that the TB is a horrible organism. It's very strong and very resistant. So what should I do now? I don't leave it to the chances. I'm not gonna give you something that work on the wall and you're resistant. That's not good, right? I will give you three different types of medication, work on three different levels. So if you have resistance and one of the components, you will not have resistance with the other. Did you get the idea of the multiple drug therapy? Okay, can you answer this? Protein synthesis. What amino means? Amino? Amino acid, amino acid protein. Yes. So, uh, tetracycline, streptomycin, they work on protein synthesis. Which, uh, which organ? Which organelle? Ribosomes. Ribosomes. How about this? Um, these um, checkpoints that I'm putting is to emphasize the most important things, okay? So I, I put it there to give you an idea what you have to know from the chapter, right? So you cannot uh, skip any one of those. Location and uh, mechanism of action. I, I think you were outside when I mentioned that. I, I mentioned that um, uh, the, um, the activity for today is flashcards on the front, I don't need a lot of details. Here's exactly what I want. You get the flashcards, and you get the names that I put on that slide. In the front, you put the name of the antibiotic. In the back, you put two things. Location, which organelle does it work on, and the mechanism, and be short. Okay, example. In the front, I put sulfonamide. In the back, which, which part? Uh, metabolic pathway. Mechanism? Folic acid. Folic acid sensor. Stop folic acid sensor. That's it. Okay? Uh, here I put, just to make it clear, here I put penicillin. Okay? Beta lactam, that would be good. Penicillin, beta lactam. This is, the, this is the front. What should I put in the back? Cell wall, peptidoglycan. Okay? Which antibiotics? The one in the list that I put for you, which is the, which are the most important ones. Okay. Okay. So this is for the antibacterial treatments. We we cover the antibacterial now. Okay. Uh, how about the antifungal? 
nothing much to know about the antifungal, but you need to know that both fungus, protozoa, helminthes, all these three are eukaryotes, isn't it? It's eukaryotes. What do you mean by eukaryote? Meaning it's kind of similar to our cells. So um, a drug of that's, that's toxic to the fungus, it can be toxic to us. So the selective toxicity here is not as good as the selective toxicity of the antibacterial. Is that clear? Is that clear? Did you get the idea? Why? Because these are eukaryotes. So what? There are a lot of similarities with our cells. So if it is toxic to the fungus, it can be toxic to our cells as well. That's why it's, it's not routine, it's not routine to give patients antifungal. The, if, if you ever notice, most of the time they use antifungal local. They put it on the skin, right? Mm -hmm. Like how many times did you hear that this person is taking uh, tablets or capsules as antifungal? That's very rare. Usually we hear about people taking antibiotics, right? Yeah. Just antibiotics. But taking antifungal systemically, that's kind of hard. Why? Because it will be toxic. You cannot avoid it. Uh, if you have to choose, let me give you an example here to, to give you exactly what I mean by this. Uh, if this patient having AIDS, okay, AIDS, and his immunity is really suppressed to the extent of his having fungal infection in the lung, okay, uh, you will tell yourself, okay, uh, I'm not going to use the antifungal because it can be toxic to our cells, right? The patient will die, literally. The AIDS patient will die. Well, I will use the, the antifungal, uh, but it's toxic. Yes, he's going to die. What should I do, right? It can, it can have some toxicity, that's fine, better than dying. But if you are a normal person, you don't have AIDS, you don't have any immunosuppression, should I give you the antifungal systemically? No. And did we understand why? Okay. How does the, the antifungal work? The first type will work on the membrane. Uh, does the fungus have a wall? The fungus have a wall? It has a membrane, but does it have a wall? No, only prokaryotes have a wall. Don't ever forget this. The most important two things that I want you to remember, prokaryotes. We have a cell wall, okay? We have a cell wall, only prokaryotes. We have a cell wall, and they do not have nuclear membrane. Is that clear? And they do not have uh, member membranous organelles. This is prokaryotes. One more time, prokaryotes. What's the most important about them? Number one, they have a cell wall. Prokaryotes have a cell wall. Does the eukaryotes have a cell wall? Most of them know. Number two, they do not have nuclear membrane. They do, ha they do have genetic material, not a membrane. Number three, they do not have membranous organelles. They only have ribosomes. Is that clear? So if you're talking about fungus, do you have a cell wall? Fungus? No, it doesn't have a cell wall. Do we have a cell membrane? Of course, any organelle or any organism have a cell membrane. The optional, in the prokaryotes only is the wall, okay? So how does this work? Of course, we don't have a wall, so we are going to work on the fungal membrane. Macrolides, for example, amphotericin B and nystatin. Okay, nystatin, this you will see it over the counter in any pharmacy. Like for, um, for uh, uh, athletic, foot or something. Uh, the other one, if you have uh, something like ringworm, uh, did, did, you know, did you, do you remember the ringworm? Mm -hmm. It's a type of tinea, looks like a ring shaped, mm -hmm. and this is kind of stubborn. It's, it will stay for, for longer time. They can use this uh, um, um, graziofolvine 
Uh, and the problem with gravy sol uh, 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 solving is it's nephrotoxic. So they, they don't try to use it unless they have to. Like if it is not, nothing is working and it, it's getting bigger, what should I do now? You can use it for limited time. Not to the extent of getting nephrotoxicity. Just lit little time. The next is antiparasitic. Antiparasitic, parasites or anti-helminthic. It's the same thing, okay? Antiparasitic, anti-helminthic. Uh, I'm sorry, no, antiparasitic including anti-helminthic. Others are antiprotozoal. <coughs> so um, uh, remember that the parasites that we need to know will include protozoa, will include helminthes. And those are eukaryotes. So again, you are going to target something in the eukaryotes. Most, most commonly, the membrane. Uh, you can take a look at this. I mean, it's, uh, you don't have to memorize everything here, but take a look at it. Just remember that these are eukaryotes and you do not have a, a wall. But you can take a look at it, like anti, anti malaria, like uh, kinins, for example, antiprotozoal metronidazide. Uh, or um, or metronidazole, <coughs> flagyl. Did you hear about flagyl before? Flagyl is something that if you go overseas, this is like almost classic. You go overseas and you have this abdominal issues and you have diarrhea. They give you that flagyl all the time because if if this is a food or drink that's not uh, clean enough, it will have some of the protozoa. Antihelminthic. They work on the metabolism, okay? And these are examples, you can take a look at it, but um, when the medication is important, I focus on it, okay? If the name is important. So other than that, take a look at it. Okay, um, antivirals. What was the issue? With the, with the helminthes, with the protozoa, with the fungus, the issue was that these are all eukaryotes, right? And what's the issue with that? It's kind of similar to our cells, right? How about the virus? What's the issue of the virus? The virus used the metabolic machinery of the host. Do you remember when we did the virus? The enter, isn't the virus's obligate intracellular? Do you remember this? It enter the cell, occupy the cell, occupy, occupy the nucleus, and use the cell machine to re replicate itself. Do you remember the activity that I told you to do? So this is the issue. So, so how can I target them if they are using our own machine? Like you're going to stop the protein synthesis. Well, it's working for the virus and for us as well. What should I do, right? So because the virus is working, is using our machinery or the machinery of the host it is the antivirus is very limited but generally speaking you can block any step of the virus cycle do you remember the viral cycle the activity that you did do you remember that when i told you like do a cell and the virus is coming to the cell it's uh, attaching it's uncoating remember this so any one of these steps can be targeted like, can you block the penetration? Yes, they penetrate. Uh, they penetrated already and they occupy the cells. Can it block the replication, transcription, translation, any one of these steps? Yes. Encyclovir, for example, it's used for herpes. Ribavirin, it's also another antivirus. AZT, this is something that I want you to remember. Okay, so you see the last three letters here? VIR, right? VIR. When you see this, it's an antiviral. Okay? But I want you to, to, to remember the ACT. ACT the mechanism of action of AZT. You can add that to your list, okay? AZT, it works on the uh, metabolic pathway, but specifically, it's a thymine analog. It interferes with DNA synthesis. 
Remember the ABC in details, and just remember a cycle there for heavy sites. Okay? So, so far, how can I uh, use antiviral? I can use it to block the penetration in the first place, to prevent the virus from getting in, right? The virus is in. The virus occupied the nucleus. The virus is using our machinery. What should I do now? You can try to block the replication of the virus, the transcription of the virus, the translation. <laughs> Uh, you can use nucleotide analogs like acyclovir and AZT. AZT is analog to thiamine. What does it mean, analog to thiamine? Like if you are doing the transcription and you're using thiamine, you will take AZT because it looks like it. You're fooling them. Do you understand the idea? Both of these. You know how these medications work? These are analogs to nucleotides. Do you remember when we talked about the genetics? When we talked about how the transcription and transmission happen? Remember that you take A and then T and then C. Remember this replication? Put the bases and, and put them beside each other. Do you guys remember this? Mm -hmm. So ACT, for example, here it's a finding analog. Uh, it's like there. You don't have to know exactly what does it look like, but it looks like one of these nucleotides. So if you're doing the replication, and it's time to take thiamine, right? I need thiamine to put it here. You see, AZT will take it instead, and it will stop you. Did you get the idea? Like if you're building this wall, okay? And you're using bricks. I'll give you this brick. It looks like your bricks, but if you use it, it's going to break down the wall for you, okay? So I'm working around you. I give you something that looks like thiamine. Use it, and it will disrupt the, the DNA for you. Did you understand the idea? You don't understand it or not? Okay, that, that's, that's good. That, that's good to tell me, right? <laughs> okay, here's what's happening. Do you remember A, T, C, G? Okay, so in order to replicate, you need to do this. Here is the DNA. Okay, and you have these. Okay? I'm going to replicate. I need a copy of this. Yeah. So I'm going to do like A, T, C, G, right? Mm -hmm. I'm taking the A, and then I'm taking the T, I'm taking the C, I'm taking the G. And then again A, and now I, instead of taking the T, I found this medication, is it T? Looks like the T. Yeah. So I will take it and put it here, instead mm -hmm. of the T. Is it like a, a substitute? Yes, it looks exactly like the time. So if, uh, if you're going to use and you put the T, next time, where's the T? You see this. Oh, I think this is the T. You put it. Okay? And then you go like A, C, A, T, C, G, and it's time to take the T again. This time you take the AZT. Putting the AZT in the middle, it's not actually fine. It looks like it, but it is not. So it's going to disrupt the DNA and the DNA will break down. Did you get the idea? <coughs> Okay, always feel free to ask about anything, okay? If it is not clear. The other thing is it can prevent the maturation. Uh, like protease inhibitors, for example. Protease inhibitor, inhibitor uh, when the viral particles start to maturate. Do you remember when the, you, you, double, you replicate uh, the DNA or RNA of the virus, and then you put the capsid on it, which is protein, remember this? In order to modify this, you're using some sort of protease to maturate, and then the virus, when they mature, they leave the cell. Do you remember this? As it is maturating, you can use another medication, like protease inhibitors. They work for the HIV, so that the virus is not going to maturate. Did you get how to target the virus now? Preventing them from entering? Preventing them from working on the DNA and RNA, <coughs> or preventing them from maturating. Yes. So, like with HIV, like if someone has it, like they're not cured, like it just keeps like going around. That is very good point. Yes, okay. it does not cure. Yeah. The the HIV is still there, mm -hmm. but it's trying to. It it did the first part. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here is the HIV. It entered into the cells already. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
and then it's taking, it's occupying that nucleus. It is duplicating, and it, it's trying to maturate to leave the cell and go to another cell. It does not maturate. So you're just limiting them <coughs> instead of occupying other cells. Okay. Unfortunately, there is nothing that can like wipe off. But we don't have that. Uh, some other medications, like medications for influenza, amantidine, rematidine, uh, uh, they discontinue that. Um, because there is a very, uh, or an increased resistance to those medications. They stopped it completely. So uh, when, when we see that there is a, a, a great resistance to a medication, we stop the medications. Uh, now they have Tamiflu. Did you hear about this before? It's very famous Tamiflu. They used it. They used to use those, but stop. It's not working anymore. And you don't have to remember the names. Just remember that there, these are old medications that's not used anymore. Tamiflu is still used only in the beginning. If it is not in the beginning, just let it go, and it will go away. It will um, uh, heal by itself, or it will go by itself. So these are the different steps. You can prevent the attachment. You can prevent them from entering. Uh, if they entered already and it's going to the nucleus, you can stop them here. You can stop the translation and, and so you can stop the maturation. So you can stop any one of these levels. Okay? Anti herpes, like I told you only acyclovir. So nothing more to know. Just remember that acyclovir work against herpes. How? Mimic the nucleotide. It looks like nucleotide. That's it. Good enough to know. Okay? Um, other medications against HIV? Uh, AIDS. Um, there are some medications for HIV or AIDS that, that we call it the antiretrovirus. Antiretrovirus. Uh, HIV itself is a retrovirus and uh, it, it uses something that's called reverse transcriptase. I don't know if you remember that or not. But HIV is an RNA virus, <coughs> right? Being an RNA virus, how does it control the DNA? They have something called reverse transcriptase. What does it mean? The normal transcription is you make RNA from DNA. Is that clear? What's transcription? You make a copy from DNA, and this copy is RNA. Clear? What if you do the opposite? Can I make DNA from RNA? It is, can, it can be done, it's kind of hard, but there is something called reverse transcriptase. So what if I give you that medication? Against reverse transcriptase, does it, does it work against HIV? Yes, it does. This is another type of medication. Interferon. What's the interferon? Nothing much to know about the interferon, but you need to know that it interfere, it in interferon for viral infection. What does it do? Interferon, the name come from, it interfere with the viral replication. It interfere with the viral replication. They use it specific, specifically for hepatitis C. Okay? Uh, they have other therapeutic pen benefits. You can uh, take a look at it if you want to. Reducing the symptoms of the colds. It's uh, uh, slow down some types of cancers. Uh, slow down only. It's not a treatment. Slow down. But what is, can we use it as a treatment? Hepatitis C. This is what I want you to remember. Hepatitis C. So interferon. What do we need to know about interferon? It interferes with the viral replication. Example, hepatitis C. There are other things. 
um, but this is the most important. So you can take a look at the other things as well and the other uses, but this is something that you cannot forget. Now drug resistance. What's a drug resistance? Drug resistance is some of these organisms developed resistance somehow, okay? To adapt to the environment against them. Like you're giving them the antibiotics and they are trying to survive. What should I do now, right? They can become resistant. Most of the time, just let me say it this way, the, these organisms are primitive enough they are not smart enough to like understand uh, this is an antibiotics and this is what I need to do. No, it doesn't happen like this. Most of the time it happened accidentally. Did you get the idea, get what I mean? They, they don't like think about it. It just happened, okay? Uh, spontaneous mutation, okay? Like you're giving me a treatment that work on the wall. Is that clear? Penicillin, for example. It works on the wall uh, against peptidin glycan specifically, right? So just for some reason unknown, spontaneous, spontaneous genetic change happened, and this genetic change changed the structure of the peptidin glycan a little bit. Now penicillin is not working anymore, right? So those who develop this criteria will be naturally selected to stay and other ones will stay be killed. Is that clear? <laughs> Another type. They found that this type of bacteria secrete chemical. Uh, we don't know why. They secrete chemical. And this chemical is breaking down penicillin, which is penicillinase, right? So these bacteria that secrete penicillinase will be naturally selected, and others are going to die, okay? And they are going to increase, and that's why we have a lot of resistance right now, because uh, those who genetically drifted or those who secrete something for some reason are going to survive, others are going to die, so these are going to flourish and increase in the number. So how does it happen exactly? You need to know this. It can be a spontaneous mutation. What does it mean? Meaning we don't know. It's just the genes change for some reason, spontaneous, we don't know. Or maybe they got, the, they, they got a different gene from other species. Uh, do you guys remember the plasmid? Something happened and it, take it, it takes this gene from here and transforms it to another bacteria. It just happened. So transforming or acquiring new genes. Uh, transferring resistant factors. This bacteria have resistant factor and plasmid, take it from there, send it to another bacteria, now the other bacteria is also resistant, okay? So the acquired new gene somehow, like this, do you, do you guys remember this? The conjugation, plasmid taking the, the, the gene and inserting it into the other bacteria. Uh, drug inactivation. You're giving a treatment, which is penicillin. Some of these bacteria secreted something, an enzyme, that's called penicillinase. This is drug inactivation. Penicillinase is going to inactivate your drug, which is penicillin, right? Why that's happening? It, it happened. They secrete something and it worked, okay? And they call that something, which is an enzyme, they call it penicillinase. The other thing is working on the per permeability. Decreasing the permeability to the drug itself. And here's how it happened. Look at this picture right here. This is normally what's happening. The drug go and attach or inter in, uh, interact with receptors and it will be allowed them. These of bacteria, they drifted, they changed, and they changed these uh, receptors, so when the medication come, when the drug come, it will not be able to interact anymore, okay? Uh, this is a change in the membrane itself. And this is actually what happened with MRSA. Do you remember the MRSA? Mesocellin resistant 
Staphylococcus aureus, how do they become mesicillin resistant? You're giving them mesicillin, and then they change the wall. Mesicillin is type of what? Which, type, which, which category, which big category of antibiotics? Penicillin. It's, it's one type of penicillin, okay? Uh, so, um, mesicillin is a type of penicillin, and you're giving them to, you're giving this medication to the Staphylococcus aureus, okay? So the Staphylococcus aureus, what they do, so this is the mechanism that's used for MRSA, is that clear? How did that happen? Staphylococcus aureus, they changed the membrane. They changed receptors in the membrane. So now, when you give mesicillin, it will try, it will try to interact with receptors on the wall, it will try to enter, but it cannot do it. Do you understand this? Always ask any question you want. If, if it's not clear, just tell me, okay? Is that clear? If not, just say, no, I will explain it. Is that clear? Okay, that, 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 that's always good to, to, to ask, okay? So here is a membrane. Right? This is the staphylococcus. You remember the staphylococcus looking like this? Yeah. This is the staphylococcus, right? Yeah. So here's the staphylococcus. Here's what's happening normally. I give you antibiotics in a cell. You have this receptors. So penicillin come, interact with the receptor, enter, kill. It. This is normal. For some reason, some of these staphylococcus, they change the receptors somehow. So the receptor now, instead of looking like this, so let's say it looks like this. Okay? So, look, here is the penicillin coming. Does it fit here? It does. It does fit and then it gets in. So somehow they change the receptor and now it looks like this. Okay, so penicillin is coming. No, you're not allowed yet. Okay, so become resistant to mesicillin. I'm talking about mesicillin now. Yes. Oh. You're taking too much mesicillin, like people are being prescribed mesicillin all the time for staphylococcus, so it happened that some of these staphylococcus were able to change the receptors on, on, the, on their membrane, so now they are resistant, and they are not going to be killed. Others are we're going to be killed, those are going to stay, and because they stay, they are going to replicate, they are going to increase their numbers, they will, they will uh, take over. So now you have to change. You, you, you're not going to use, if that the case. But is the mechanism clear? Yeah. Uh, here is another thing that they found it, which is very weird. They found some organisms, some bacteria, are able to pump out the antibiotics. Pump it out. So the antibiotics gets them. Look at this. Look at the picture. This is a medication, right? And they're interacting with the receptor. This is another mechanism. You're not changing the receptor. It's okay. You interact with the receptor and you get in. And then I'll pump you out. You get in, I'll pump you out somehow. Some bacteria can do that. How? We don't know. They develop this somehow, genetic changes, we don't know, but they, they acquire this ability. If that's the case, they are resistant. Some of these um, um, bacteria are multi -drug resist have multi-drug resistant pumps. Some of these, okay? not only one medication, they have multiple. They can pump out different medications. Like, you get the penicillin, it interacts with the receptor, it gets in, but then you pump it out. And then you give them cephalosporin, it gets in and then you pump it out. Some bacteria can do that, okay? Which, which is called the multi-drug resistant pumps. Um, so what's happening here is, you give them medication, it enter, and you pump it out. If it is multi-drug, it can deal with different drugs. At any time, if you guys have a question, please let me know. All right? Everything should be clear enough. I mean, the chapter is hard enough. 
So I'm trying to explain it as much as possible. You have a question, just let me know so it will be easier to study. Okay? Other ways to acquire resistance is to change the binding site. Example, tetracycline. Tetracycline work on the ribosome, right? I told you to, to memorize these uh, medications and you're going to do uh, the activity for it, okay? So tetracycline, as an example of protein synthesis inhibitors. It goes to the ribosome, and an act of the ribosome, stop protein synthesis. How about this? What if I change my ribosomes, the way it looks, or the, the, the site that you bind to? If you're going to bind to this site, Look at this, I have this side. And you are designed to go into this side, right? I'm going to change it so you cannot bind to it. So if you change like here, it becomes circle. Look at this. Can you fit in here? No. So you, can you change the binding side? Yes. Instead of, being um, uh, uh, if instead of being triangular, so the medication can fit in, I'm going to make it like this. On the ribosome. So when you come to the ribosome, you will not find what you're supposed to find, which is your binding site. Using an alternative pathway, this is another way to uh, acquire a drug resistance, right? So here is the pathway. And when we say metabolic pathway means reaction after reaction after reaction, okay? So we have uh, component A that will become B, C, D, E. So this is the way to produce, uh, let's say, folic acid. Okay? From one, irrespective of, uh, irrespective of the detail. You do step after step after step after step and then you, until you make folic acid, right? So if I give you a medication here that stop the folic acid, it just happened that some bacteria were able to do an alternative pathway. You are stopping this pathway, okay, I'm going to do it in a different way. So you gave me the medication, it's not going to work. And this is another way of um, uh, 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 doing the resistance. And remember the sulfonamides? Sulfonamides. Sulfonamide will block like folic acid, okay, you're going to block the normal pathway, I will do another pathway. Can you answer this? So others are, are correct, right? Yeah. They can stop the synthesis, they can stop the maturation, they can block the receptors. Yes. So this will bring us to the natural selection, and natural selection is simply those of the microbes that were able to, to develop drug resistance are going to stay, are going to survive, are going to replicate, increase their numbers, and those that were destroyed will disappear time after time. With time they are going to disappear, and those better ones that are resistant are going to uh, stay, natural selection. The interaction between drug and host. How the, interac uh, the, the drugs are going to affect the host. Uh, the host is most likely we're talking about us, humans. Okay? How is it going to interact with ourselves? The problem is they found that about 5% of those taking the antimicrobials might have side effects. What are the side effects? Side effects include direct damage if taken in uh, big amounts. It can uh, include allergic reaction. It can also disrupt the normal flora, leading to super infection. What super infection? Here's a super infection. I have infection, right? I have pneumonia. You're giving me broad spectrum antibiotics, okay? Broad spectrum is going to kill gram positive, gram negative, plus, Plus, what else? You're going to, call it to kill your normal flora. 
So if you have harmful bacteria, they found they will the, the, the harmful bacteria will find the field empty, right? They don't have competitors. They will take over and they cause super infection. So the infection is what happened in the beginning that you're getting antibiotics against. And then another one came because you disrupted the normal flora. And we call that super infection. Like Clostridium difficulis, for example. Uh, this is very famous. You take the antibiotics for some time, and then after like two weeks or something, I have severe diarrhea. Can you tell me why I get this diarrhea? I will tell you that broad spectrum kills your natural flora. I eliminated the competition for this type, Clostridium for this type. So it takes over your coolant and it causes diarrhea. Did you get the idea? Yeah. For super infection? <coughs> Allergic. Uh, allergic reaction does not does does not happen from the first time. Let me say this piece of information. Uh, I have penicillin. Uh, I have penicillin allergy. The first time you give me the medication, I will not have the allergic reaction. I will develop my allergic components ready for the next time. At this point, clear. So allergy will develop next time, not the first time. Okay. Uh, other toxicities. I don't know if you know that or not, and it's not even important, but just for your information. Um, if you take Tylenol, what will happen if, if you give me this bottle of Tylenol and I take all of it? What will happen? It will damage my liver. What if you give me like this bottle of Advil? Can I, if I take the whole thing, like people can commit suicide by this, right? You take the whole bottle. Uh, can the ibuprofen, like the Advil, this is good. Did everybody take it? Yeah, but don't take up the whole bottle, right? If you take it, it will destroy your kidney, specifically. Okay, so it can be liver toxic, hepatotoxic, can be um, nephrotoxic, and so on. If this is an allergic reaction, what's the most common one for the allergy? What's the most common antibiotic that have allergy? Penicillin. Penicillin. So is that the case, penicillin will work as antigen? To be more specific, it's not a complete antigen. It's also information. It's more of an actin. Okay? But it will work as an antigen. Uh, and you are going to develop allergy. Allergy can be hives. Do you know what's hives? Yeah. Itching and sneezing. So you can develop hives, and this is the mild form. But it can go to anaphylaxis as well. Do you know what's uh, uh, different between hives and anaphylaxis? This is a mild allergy, this is severe allergy. Anaphylaxis is yeah, you, you suffocating, right? You have bronchial constriction and drop of the blood pressure. So it can go to that extent. Uh, most allergies will be against penicillin. Okay? Another side effect is the discoloration of the teeth, tetracycline. And that's why. Do not ever give tetracycline to children with growing teeth. It will mix with the teeth and it's going to dis discolor it or, or make uh, discolor it, it's cause discoloration of the teeth. This is something that's well known for tetracycline. The way I remember it, if that's going to help, tetra means four, right? Tetra means four. So I remember it, tetracycline, it will make four colors of the skin. Tetracycline, coloration, four colors. Okay? It's discoloration if you're growing teeth, not, not us. Children will have the growing teeth, right? Um, again, this is uh, the super infection. How does it happen? You're giving a broad spectrum, killing the normal flora, no more competition for Clostridium difficilis, for example, that will cause diarrhea. So diarrhea is a super infection. Uh, when you consider antimicrobial drug, I think we talked about this before, uh, you need to know the nature of the microorganism first, most of the time. So um, they do like throat, uh, a throat swap, right? If, if they think that you might have a uh, strep throat or something, they take a swab, right? Why they are taking a swab? They need to know exactly if you have streptococcus or not. If you have it, I'll give you something specific for that. So it's, it's always good to know what type. Uh, practically speaking, we don't do that all the time. Like 
You don't like every time you go to the doctor, they will tell you, okay, we need to find out what kind of organism is it. No, it doesn't happen like this. But if it is something that's that, that as bad as Streptococcus or Staphylococcus, it's better to know. Uh, the medical condition of the patient. Can he afford taking that medication or not? Or which medication is good for him in that case? Uh, the sensitivity of the organism to the drug. Is uh, this organism sensitive to that drug or not? Uh, what determine the, the, the antimicrobial activities? Uh, what are you treating, which is a microorganism? The length of exposure, how long are you going to take it and how long you were uh, infected? How, how long did you have this infection? Uh, how strong the medication is and the organisms that are being treated. Uh, factors that influence the action are number of microorganisms, the type of microorganism, even the temperature and pH they will determine how effective the medication is. And the mode are, and dose of the agent, are you taking this by mouth? Are you taking this IV? Of course, the IV is more effective, right? IV is more effective. It goes directly to the blood. So you're taking the whole dose. And what's the dose? Am I giving you half a gram, like 500, or am I giving you a gram? Obviously, the dose will make a difference. Now, to test the susceptibility, What's the susceptibility again? Sensitivity. Uh, what do you mean? I mean, I need to know if this organism is sensitive to that antibiotic or not before I give it to you. Is that clear? So this will give us three different ways to know. If you have resistance or not. Uh, I want you to test the sensitivity. You need to tell me, are you sensitive or resistant? Is your bacteria or microbes is it sensitive? You know what sensitive means? <coughs> sensitive, when I say this bacteria is sensitive to the antibiotic means the antibiotic will kill it. Okay? So I would like to know if this microorganism, if this bacteria is sensitive to our medication or not. Is that clear? So I, uh, tell me if it is sensitive or not. If it is not sensitive, it means it's resistant. Right? Did you get the idea? So I wanted to know if it is sensitive or resistant, how to know. Three different ways. Number one, Kirby Bauer disc diffusion test. Number two is E-test. Number three is tube dilution test. Okay? What are these doing? Testing the sensitivity. What do you mean? It's telling me if this organism is sensitive or resistant. Is that clear? This is the, the use of all these things. But when we come to the tube dilution test, it's giving us something that's very important to know, which is the MIC, the MIC, which is the minimum inhibitory concentration. What is that? And by the way, this is something that uh, pharmaceutical companies we have to do. This is, uh, uh, this is part of their production. Before taking the license, by the way, if they go like to the, to the FDA and say, uh, we need to uh, provide this medication, they will tell them, give me the, the, the MIC first, okay? What's the MIC? Minimum inhibitory, or the minimum inhibitory concentration. Tell me, what's the minimum concentration that can kill the bacteria? So we can use it. Like, if, if, if a half a gram is good enough, we don't have to use a gram, right? You need to tell me exactly what's the minimum that can inhibit the bacterial loss. In this case, tube dilution test, they, microbiologists, they take a serial dilution of the antimicrobials, okay? And they put it like this, five, six, seven, whatever. They put different dilutions, and then they put standard amount of the pathogen, and see which one is uh, the minimal that will be affected. Uh, I will show you the picture, will make it uh, more obvious. But generally speaking, it looks like this. Look, if I have this, here's a tube. Two, three, four, five. Okay, these are five tubes, right? And I'm going to put here one gram, uh, one, um, what, 100 milligram, 200. 
300, 400, 500, okay? 100, 200 of what? Of the antimicrobials, of the antibiotics, okay? And then I'm going to put here the same amount of, of, of the pathogen from the patient. I put this, exactly the same as this, exactly the same as this, 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 okay? So I will see this one is killing the bacteria. So what, this one is good, but this is very high. This one is killing the bacteria. Okay, this one is good, but high. This one is killing the bacteria. Mm -hmm. This one is not killing the bacteria. Which one should I use? Yes, number three. Did you get the idea? I can't use 100 or 200. It's, it doesn't kill the bacteria. Which one is the minimum that kill the bacteria? It's this one. Should I give you four or five? Why? Why give you something that I can give less and it's going to do the job, right? So this is the MIC, the dilution way. Do you understand it? You call it the tube dilution test. And this is how they do it. For the Kirby, yes. Uh, no, this is the pharmaceutical companies do that, okay. and, and and they put it on the prescription. If you if you open the medication, you will see this. They will you will see the MIC. They have to do it before getting uh, authorization to produce the medication. Like the FDA will say, uh, what's the, what's your MIC? Uh, I don't know yet. No, of course they know. But I'm just giving a scenario. Mm -hmm. And you have to tell me. So this is what the pharmaceutical companies do. In the beginning, they will have to put like this. And when it comes to the MIC, uh, what's your MIC? Uh, 300, okay. Um, then I will not get 500. But can I give 100? No, it's not going to, going to do the job. Do you understand it? Okay. Uh, the other type can also work is the Kirby Bohr test. This is a test that's simply uh, using the size of the zone around the organ to tell me uh, if this uh, microbe is susceptible or resistant. Instead of doing this, there is another way, which is the Kirby dish, or the Kirby test. And we simply do it like this. Here is our dish like this. Okay? And I'm going to put different microbes here, <coughs> the other way around. Instead of changing the doses of the antibiotics, I'm going to put antibiotic here. Okay? And I'm going to put this pathogen here. Another one here. This is one, two, three and four. And here's what I'm going to notice. Here's what's happening. These are pathogens, right? Different pathogens. And the antibiotic is around them. And the antibiotic is, tr is, is going to work against these organisms, right? And then it will create a zone around them like this. Which one is the biggest zone? Which, which one? Four. four, right? So number four is the big zone. What is that zone? This is the effectiveness of the antibiotics. This is how much it is surrounding and it is inhibiting. So the larger the zone, the more sensitive it is. Okay, did you get this? So, uh, no, I'm not gonna give it to this, to number two. This does not work well on number two because the zone here is too small. This, is, this zone is really big, meaning the antibiotics is working really good, making all of this, surrounding it, and working on it, and inhibiting it. So the, the, um, the greater the zone, the more sensitive it is. Can you tell me which one of these organisms is the most sensitive to the antibiotic? Yes, which one of those? One, two, three, four. Which one is the most sensitive to the antibiotics? Four, so that should give it to four. Should you give it to two 
Of course not. This is the smallest. So it means that number two is really resistant to that antibiotics. I will not give the antibiotics. And they do this in the pharmaceutical companies as well to tell you which organism should you use it for. Did you get the idea? Like, and this is sulfa, and it is working on this. On the E. coli, for example. So we'll tell you, please use sulfa for E. coli. And you say, okay, can I use it for staphylococcus? No, no, it doesn't work again. Um, you need also, the need, microbiologists should avoid the contaminants. Microbe microbiological contaminants is other microbes that are not supposed to be there. So if you're using specific microbes, you need to avoid the, the possibility of having contaminants, which are, which are other microorganisms are not supposed to be there, unwanted. So here is a Kerbibor test. See the zone, zone of inhibition here? This is very small, right? This is almost nothing. So I'm not going to use it for this one, right? Which one should I use it? Which one of those, for example? I should use it for this one, right? Because look how the zone of inhibition is really big. I mean, the antibiotic is really effective against this one. But if you look at this one, should I use it for this? Of course not. The zone is too small, so I'm not going to use it. How about this? This is something that we found. How about if this is almost equal, right? Almost. So what, what should I use it for? Like, is it OK for both of them? No. This one, the zone, still have some of the microbes here. OK? So this zone is not perfect. Use it for this. OK? Generally speaking, here's what I want you to know. If we're talking about this Kibri test, the bigger the zone, the more sensitive the organism is. That's it. The bigger the zone, the more sensitive. The smaller the zone, the more resistant. Is that clear? Yeah. That's it. E-test is more of a diffusion test. You're using, it's very close to the same thing. You're using uh, different types of uh, antibiotics like imipenium and um, uh, cefazidine. Cefazidine is one of the cephalosporins. Irrespective, this is not the issue. The issue is how much diffusion are you going to do? Okay, you're diffusing more, it means it's less effective. This is the, the dilution test. Look at how the doses look like. This is a controlled dose, nothing is here. And then more, 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 more. Uh, I'm going to pick this one. Okay, you see how this one is clear? Before that, it didn't kill. Here it killed, right? And here it killed, here it killed. Which one should I use? This. Because this is the MIC. This is the minimum. If this is working, if 1.6 is working, why should I give you 3.2? Because it's working. Yes, but I can give you this dose and it's still working. Did you understand the idea? This is the MIC with the dilution test. So it's the same explanation in a different way. Uh, now, there's something called therapeutic index that you need to know. What's the therapeutic index? Therapeutic index is an index that describes the ratio between the dose of the medication that's toxic to the minimal effective dose. Okay? Like, uh, if I give you 2 gram, this is the minimum effective dose, and it's going to work. If I give you four, six, eight, that's all okay. If I give you 10, it will become toxic now. It's a relationship between what's toxic and what's the minimum effective. Is that clear? You, the bigger the index, the better the medication is. Meaning, just think about it this way. If I give you a medication that the minimum effective dose is two, and it's toxic as four, at four, is that good? Like, if any mistake happened, it's toxic. This is bad, right? But if I give you 2 is effective and 10 is toxic, this is a better medication, right? Because if, it's, if, I, if I give you 4 for some reason, it's not going to be toxic, right? Even if I give you 6. So the bigger the index, the better the medication is. Is that clear? Yes. Make sure to understand everything here. It will make it easier. If you don't understand, just tell me. 
Okay, uh, which one do you think? The smallest concentration. The smallest concentration. Uh, strategies to limit the drug resistance. They are, uh, like if you, if you wanted to take an antibiotic, you have to have a prescription, right? You can't go like go get your uh, antibiotics. Why? Because of the, the, the abuse of the antibiotics that led, led to development of huge problem, which is resistance. So what should we do now? The physician should give, make a good diagnosis and give antibiotic that's good for this specific diagnosis. The patient, no, this is number one, the patient should take the medication as prescribed and until the whole medication is gone. You can't tell me uh, I gave you like 12 capsules and I'm, I'm telling you to take two per day and then two days later you feel good, I'm going to stop. No. You're not supposed to do that. But I feel good. Yes, but you're not treated yet. You feel good, but you're not treated yet. You have to finish every single capsule that I give you. I give you 12 for 6 days. You have to take all 12. You don't even leave one. Okay? This is a compliance of the patient. Um, a shotgun approach is just an approach that you need to understand that they say, okay, well, what should we do now? This patient is having several infections or something and we need to do something about it. So, like to shoot gun, you're shooting everything. You give a broad spectrum antibiotic just to wipe off everything. And this should be used as a last resort. You're not supposed to do that, unless you have to. Like, what should I do now? I have to work something right now. The patient is have a lot of infections. Just give him the shotgun. Uh, there is a lot of drug research uh, that's trying to, they are trying to, fi to find medications with less side effects, medication that we don't have allergy against it, medication that uh, bacteria didn't develop um, uh, resistance against yet. So this research is going on, but on the long term, there is something that should be noticed. Number one, in order to take an anti antibiotics, it has to be a, a justification. Example, if you're having flu, should I give you antibiotics? Of course not. What the antibiotics is going to do? If you have colds, should I give you antibiotics? Of course not. What is it going to do? Nothing. It's just going to create an issue, right? So give it only if you are sure that this is a bacterial infection. We know that colds and, and, and flu is a virus, right? What's the, what the antibiotic is going to do with the virus? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Actually, it's harmful because it will cause resistance and it will disrupt your normal flora. This is one thing. Um, you, you try to use the antibiotic for one or two types of infection. So uh, doctors and nurses should work together and say, okay, let's use uh, the ampicillin for uh, streptococcal pneumonia, for example. Let's try to use it for this. Don't use like randomly. Don't give like random uh, ampicillin for anything. Okay. Try to limit it for specific types. Um, other things are you can take a vaccine instead of waiting for you to get the disease and give you the antibiotics. Why don't you take the vaccine, right? And we have a lot of vaccines. Uh, the other thing is do not give animals and and, and plants antibiotics they do that they do randomly they give antibiotics to to the animals you are going to take it with the antibiotics in it right so that should be uh, avoided as much as possible okay so uh, that's it for this chapter